Because the whole point of this is to get a bit of a debate about that question there. Um, so it's sort of a slightly provocative question. Um, it has a bit of a history of the question, which I'll explain. Um, it would be good to have a little discussion afterwards, and that, that I don't want to lose that as part of the time, because we are starting about 12 minutes a bit later. So that question came from a, um, um, a forum in memory of Tom Conlon, who um, was a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, who said a lot about technology, sometimes um, against the way it was being presented um, in education. And so my background, which I'll explain, um, wanted to have a, a, d a debate in this area, but coming from a different angle, which is about the role of um, computing for very young children. That was back in um, November, um, so about a year ago. Um, my background, um, I was an infant trained teacher down in England, um, and I taught in primary um, for a couple of years, and I worked in special education for about six years. Um, because I knew how the projects worked, I became the ICT teacher and I had to learn on the spot there. It was quite a challenge because in my class um, I had children going all the way from the P levels, which is pre level one, you know, learning cause and effect, to children who were able to hack into Habbo Hotel. So it, I didn't have many children, about seven in the class, but it was quite a challenge trying to work that one out. Um, at the uh, University of Edinburgh, um, then we have the Children and Technology Group, um, which by default of having some time to go on the website, I became the director of. Um, and in my spare time when I'm not at the university, um, I have a company where we create a, um, we have a product for teaching computers in the early years. Um, obviously come and speak to me in a different room area if you're interested in that. Um, and I'm also a parent, um, and you might actually see those two around the corner, um, and they feature um, in some of the slides. So that, that's sort of um, my background here. Now, let's try, those people who have logged on to that, um, I'm going to ask a question here. Um, just to start off with, um, what age do you think children are ready to start learning computing? Okay. So if you are on, if you're not, you're not there, can you click on that? Can you just put your finger once on what age you think? So at some point, 18, a bit earlier, do you think they should start learning in primary? Just put your finger roughly on there where you think. So, seven people. So we give it. Um, actually, because you, cause those people there, uh, give it another. Uh, that's that's the um, that's the link there. Give it another twenty seconds. Okay. So that's uh, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine. Thirty, four, ten more seconds. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's um. Yeah, that's quite interesting. So. Uh, right, so that's what we've got here. So I'm actually surprised we've got somebody, um, at least one there. Um, okay, so around around five, so basically the start of um, primary school, but there are some people thinking that pre-primary school then. Um, that's really annoying, because that takes the impact away from my talk, because you're all meant to be, you're all meant to be here, and I'm going to go well there. So that's it, we're finished. Um, okay, so what... What I'm going to try and argue is, is from birth, okay? And, and by the end of it, we can all debate whether that's silly um, or whether there is some um, significance in, in trying to make that um, an assertion. So, okay, if you look to what's going on around the world, um, in terms of curriculums, south of the border, we know the computing curriculum came, curriculum came in, and that's for five-year-olds. So somebody somewhere believes that we should learn from the age of five. Um, and there we have a lovely classic photo of Michael Gove. Um, and this is sort of maybe a reflection of how... Um, somebody thinks it could be moving forward. With children sitting there with these new um, tools that we've got, very good tools to help children learn on devices such as iPads. Um, so we did have things like Scratch. Um, and Scratch, I think, really, um, state it's from eight onwards, um, and lots of computing tools that have been around. Probably seven, eight was the age that children could access these tools to help computing. So how are you going to teach younger children? Well, we're starting to get devices that are more accessible, and along with that, we're starting to get apps that are more accessible. So we have things like Scratch Junior, 
Um, so I think they might have upped it to five on a controversial level, but it, originally it was four plus. So already we're getting below this five years old mark by things that children can, can play with. And I, my little boy who's three can sort of interact with that a little bit, um, so maybe even less than four, uh, four. So there we're actually starting to go to early years context, preschool context. But if you start looking around the market, especially a place like Kickstarter, um, which reflects very often uh, the US market, we start, it's, it's a big market here. Uh, this idea that children should get into computing is starting to, um, to, to resound with lots of parents, uh, very often parents of computer scientists or Google employees. But it's enough that these things are getting funded. Okay? The most popular board game sold on Kickstarter is called Robot Turtles, which is the most backed board game in Kickstarter history. It's sneakily because you wouldn't want them to know about it, teaches programming to children from the age of three. Okay? So you've got three. Um, another iPhone one, I think that's about four. Primer, I think four. I think this one's three or four. So about three, because before three, it becomes quite difficult to design something that a young child can interact with. So according to the commercial world, the answer would be something like three. But what's the, what's the research behind this? What's the pedagogy behind these designs that we've seen there, behind things like Scratch? Um, in, a, in a paper that's been accepted, um, we, we make an argument that um, there is a problem in the way that the speed that things are happening, it hasn't really had enough time to draw upon a lot of research that would be very valuable for this area. Now, it's very complex because there's so much research that is valuable, but um, here's three different areas that are quickly skim through as a flavour of the type of things that um, we have research on that could really inform this debate around the role of teaching and computing that maybe we haven't um, adhered to. So, does anyone recognise this? So you, so you know you've got a particular crown when people say yes there. Because, uh, the answer, yeah, there. So that was, um, although I get told off of this, I keep saying that's logo and it's not, is it? So the computer science here will tell me it's, it's the turtle which uses the logo. Um, so when this came out, logo, and it was used a lot. So we've been here before, um, um, and I remember I used the logo in my classroom. Um, I used the, the on-screen version rather than the um, the physical robot, um, and it was very popular. It was very popular at the time. The BBC Micro. Um, it was used a lot in school. So part of you thinks, well, why didn't it work? What, what, what went wrong? Well, at the time, there was a lot of research into the effect of logo. You know, does logo help children? It wasn't just about learning computing, it was helping other problem-solving skills. Logo was more about the sort of philosophy of getting children to be able to externalise their thinking and to help thought processes in areas such as mathematics. So they had a look at whether logo impacted problem-solving ability. And there was really mixed results. Some said yes, some said no. And Papa, who, who um, was sort of the pioneer behind this, um, said, well, you're, you're asking the wrong question. You don't look for the logo effect. Because the whole point of Logo is meant to sort of be part and embody an a, a approach to education that, is, is, that comes from Piaget, the idea that children are, have an opportunity to, to externalise their thinking, to construct um, different ideas. You don't simply bring in a tool and see whether you've got a learning effect. That's the wrong way of doing it. It missed the whole point of it. So we have to think about, could you imagine someone looking for the scratch effect now? You know, how much does scratch improve your math scores? I don't think it's... Um, it's realms of possibility. The other thing that happened is a lot of read people realised that this tool was coming to classrooms without proper training. And so it was more a ch case of classroom management. You had these devices, you know, these computers, and Logo was there, and it was more, you know, could you get children to go through it? There wasn't the, 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 the teaching um, development that was required to, to adopt a Papert's approach. And that, that, in a way, really limited the way it was being used. You know, Logo was being used to, to can you do these sequence of instructions in this way. It, crucially, by not having the teacher there um, fully com uh, confident in, in using Logo and, and, and understanding the wider picture, it wasn't tapping into those important thinking skills as much as it might do. It, was, it became more of a, can you follow the sequences of Logo? We have the area of computational thinking. So, um, in the last um, 10 years, um, this has become um, a, a a, a key expression. I think it's in the, um, the UK curriculum they talk about it. We've talked about it a lot here. Um, and in a way, that it gives hope because it does bring out this idea of thinking skills. 
So I'll if, give you a chance, and I'll read it out. Um, computational thinking is the thought processes involved in formulating problems and their solutions, so that solutions are represented in a form that can be effectively carried out by an information processing agent, computer or another person. That's not, it doesn't naturally slip off the tongue, that. But it, it sort of highlights that, actually, wait a minute, if you take that as it is, <coughs> you don't really need lots of tools. There's lots of things here that are very relevant to everyday um, learning contexts. Thinking skills, thinking through problems. You know, what would I do in this context? You do that a lot in another STEM subject. Problem solving, problem finding, problem solving. And this idea that representing a form that we effectively carried out by an information processing agent, by including a person as well as a computer as that agent, you've got communication as a key part. So what age do children start learning good communication skills that you give instructions and to follow them? So by taking something like this, there's a lot of potential to realise that this, has a, this, this approach has a lot of relevance to teaching computers at a young age. Is that approach really embodied in tools such as the ones I showed before? Is that really about that, or is that just about learning certain skills on, a, on an iPad? And most importantly, early years STEM education. Um, so one of the projects I was on for a year and a half was called Creative Little Scientist, and that was looking at the role of creativity in science and maths. And it was really, really interesting, because it was all about giving children um, the chance to explore ideas that were relevant in the world, to make it very meaningful, let them play with these ideas, let them make mistakes, let them talk about it. And this idea of creativity in early um, STEM education seems extremely relevant for computing. So... Obviously, to give a talk and talk about all the principles of early education would be ridiculous, but some of these themes here, I think, I think those people who work in the early years would agree are relevant in this context. But it's not just about procedures, it's about understanding what you're doing. The, the role of being creative, and by creative I don't mean pretty, you know, it's an animation that is all colourful, I talk about the opportunity to try different things and reason about different ways of doing things and try novel different ways of approaching things. Social, it's a very social context, you know. Physical, yeah, so this age, be able to express your ideas through your body, through gesture, through action. Critically, the role of the teacher in the early years, extremely important role. It has to be engaging. You can't tell somebody it's really important because in 20 years' time, if they want to hit the job market when they're five, it's not really relevant. You need to make it engaging, and by doing that, it has to be very meaningful and relevant. So if we take all these themes... And then we look at something like this. Now, I know that girl probably isn't five, but we have to wonder how much the current approaches of trying to design really flash tools that you can use on different you know, screens, some of the approaches being taken, addressing these. Now, there are. I've been very unfair, because in a way I've sort of um, stereotyped approaches at the moment as of giving children an iPad to learn on. I know that's not the way. There is lots of great stuff, the unplugged work. There are lots of resources out there. But how much... Um, training or education and teaching teachers given to be able to be critically reflective of the different tools around them and to think about the different ways that they tap into this, what we know about how young children learn. So, okay, so what else would you do? I mean, you need resources. So what type of resources would you use if, you, if these devices aren't the best thing? Well, I would argue that the best resource is the world. Okay? So each picture here has a problem in it. Um, and so, if I just give you a minute to look at each one and work out what is the problem and how is it being solved, and how do we solve that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 200 years ago? So, if I take this one here, I've got streetlights. Okay. So, children live in a world where streetlights come on. It just seems so natural, but why? How do they know to come on? How, do, you know, how does that happen? What, what, what would happen if 200 years ago we didn't have computers? How did streetlights know to come on? Well, they didn't. So, how, what do we do to light up the streets? Why, why do we need to light up the streets? There's a lot going on here. Okay? We now, though, have designed really clever ways that places that are dark can light up. Have we perfected it? No, there's still areas that aren't lit up. There are still lamps that come on when it's light. We don't need them. What happens there? Sliding doors. We used to have to open a door. <laughs> <laughs> now we don't. 
So it's great in some ways if you're carrying something, that's fantastic. But who's ever been on a train and the door is just opening and closing? It's not going right. Why? What's happening? How does, it, how does that door know that you're there? Now, I know maybe no is not the right word, but how is it able to detect? What happens if? So if I stand here, what happens? Each of these has a problem, a very real problem that children have every day in their world, and we have designed, using technology, an, a, a new way of solving this. And if it's a good way, it will become successful and we will use it. But it's still changing. And in 20 years' time, we will probably not have these. They will laugh at these, because someone would have thought, probably using computers, of a new way of solving the problem and communicating it in a way that they're able to, to create this idea um, and, 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 and build it up so people can use it in different areas. So things that we're on the cusp of doing at the moment is looking at ways we can solve the problem of having to sit behind the steering wheel when we're driving, or maybe safety. Is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? What's the problem with that one there? These are real issues, and something that children can be really, really involved in. So how old? How do you need to, how old do you need to be? But I suppose I would ask, how old do you need to be to experience computing in the world? What age do children go through an automatic door? At what age do they sit there in the shop and go, bleep, bleep, bleep? At what age do they see mum and dad with the cards doing this and suddenly realising? We use pennies in, in, in classrooms, but seeing that's going to be, it's not going to look real. This is how you pay for stuff. <coughs> <laughs> Toys. Anyone who's got Skylanders or Digital Infinity, that toy has got something in it that's loading data from your gameplay. What age do you start doing those? Those are meant to be for eight-year-olds, but that's going to come down. I, in my business, we're looking at these type of toys for children you know, from birth. Digitalised toys. What age it, can you hear particular types of languages? Structuring the if and then. You know, if it rains, then we'll take an umbrella. You know, what age do you start wondering if there's a computer in it? We did a great study with, with um, Professor Robertson over there, who, um, um, who we looked at, ch at what age children understood computing and what, um, when things had computers in them. And what was really interesting is we actually came across lots where we weren't quite sure. You know, that bicycle, I don't think so, that toy, maybe. It's really interesting, and the fact is it's changing. Things that didn't have computers in there will have computers. The Internet of Things is going to change that question so much. So wondering what has a computer in it is, is an interesting thing. To, what might happen in the future? Do they prefer the computer or not computer? Do they like going through a machine? Do they like the quick desk or do they like talking to a person? <coughs> Why? What's the difference? Do they understand that we're going through traffic lights? We talk about, oh, the traffic light hates me, and it hated me this morning. <laughs> But do they understand it's actually not a traffic light doing anything? I watch things like CBBS, and my children are addicted and love CBBS. Um, but when you see robots being having a life themselves, I wonder. I am interested whether that gives children the impression that robots do have minds of their own, or whether they realise that things like traffic lights and robots and all these technologies, somebody gave them instructions. And the most powerful thing, and I suppose it's a question of what time children can learn this is to realise that they could be that person to give instructions. And so I suppose the big message I would say is, wouldn't it be amazing if before we started getting children learning to code, they wanted to code? Okay? Rather than saying, here, trust me, this will be fun, and some children will find it fun, imagine if you had children who realised the power of computing and said, I want to code, give me something, teach me how to code, I want to do this thing. Because we do know in subjects like maths that has failed. That very often we have had approaches in areas like maths where we said, just trust us, maths is important. And guess what happens? So what age? Well, this is where it's great having children. No cassette forms. Photos, videos. This is um, one years old. So let's have a look at that again, okay? He, he obviously gets it, because he stands up there, but it doesn't work. Why doesn't that work? It's meant to work. You stand in front of a door and it opens, okay? So why didn't it work? What's he got wrong? It's the sensor, isn't it? He stood it slightly outside of where the sensor is. But he saw it, he worked it out, and now he can go through a door, which is a real shame, especially if you're in a supermarket that's next to a busy road. <laughs> 
So how young is too young? Well, what would the answer be if it was reading? What age do you think it's good to get a book and read through you know, books? Children can't decode text, they can't write their own stories. Why the hell would you get a baby in front of a book? Because it's a culture, it's an important culture. Reading is a really important culture. So do we believe that computing is an important part of a culture? And if you do believe it, why would you not start thinking, talking, experiencing, and, and bringing children up in this world of computing from birth in a way that they understand it, they can see what's good about it, what's bad about it, they can reason about it, and they're very excited about the fact they can learn the skills to do it and make the world a better place. So, given that, <laughs> um, can you have another go? And don't annoy me by just. <laughs> I went a bit faster in order that we can hopefully get a little bit. Okay. Okay. So. <coughs> Yeah, mostly, yeah, we've got a bit of bias thing we've got, yeah. Um, 20 people in second sample. Um, okay, so let's have a look. Um, okay. Now that is statistically significant, I know it. <laughs> um, okay, obviously, what is silly here is, what do you mean by computer? Okay, and in a way, that's why I think it's really important. What do we mean by computing? What do we mean by reading? Okay? Because depending on if you think computing is about using a device to give instructions, obviously it's not going to be from birth. But if you think computing is something else, then maybe. Um, so I thought I'd then turn it to everyone. Hopefully there's enough time now to, to get people's thoughts. Um, sorry, to, <laughs> so why should I just say any questions? Yeah. I'm just going to play devil's advocate. Yep. I have friends who hate teaching ICT to P1s and P2s. Partly because of the practical problems of doing it. But one of them sent me a, a paper that was written by, I think it was a Nordic academic, who claimed you could actually do cognitive damage to children uh, if you taught them ICT too young. I'm not saying I support that idea, but it was sort of a learned you know, paper, which I read. I looked so afraid to it, but have you any comments on that? Yeah. <coughs> Writing. You can also, if you get a pencil and stab someone with it, it's extremely dangerous. Okay? That sounds like a flipping answer, but what do you mean by ICT? I mean, it's the same question I get people asking, well, what do you think? Do you think iPads are good for children? Well, that depends. I mean, I have my two kids around the corner on an iPad. Sometimes it's fantastic. Sometimes I think it's really, really good. I think there's lots of stuff on it. There's other stuff on it. I think, what? You've just taken pedagogy back 50 years. You're doing rote learning on something. You know. So ICT is too general. I think what it, there is, it's, it's a device that opens up a world um, and it, it can be scary for parents. I think one of the biggest dangers of technology is it, it disempowers adults. They feel that suddenly children know it all, they're, they're na natives and therefore, and that's wrong, especially in the early years, absolutely wrong. Children are very good at clicking things really quickly and not being scared of trying things out. But that's not, learning's not just about that. There's lots of things reflecting what you're doing, just making decisions, and that's where adults play a massive role. So I think technology, it depends on how it's designed. I think there needs to be more communication between designers and um, teachers and, and people who, who have researched in that area. Um, we have to be critical. I think it's really difficult. You know, one of the big questions, which app is good? Well, you, you can't continue to give people, this is a list of apps that work. I think it's having a critical mindset of which might, what might work. But empowering adults to, to feel more confident in, in making decisions and working with children with technology. And then, no, I, then I would disagree that it's bad. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to extend your answer by saying that I, mean, I didn't think what you talked about there was anything like the traditional teaching <coughs> SET to primary school children. It was all about exploring your world and recognising that our world is now going to be as much influenced by uh, detection.
deterministic mechanical electronic devices as it is going to be controlled by humans or the sun or all that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so you know, yeah, I, I really like your message. Get them, get them to just appreciate there's something there enough that they they want to carry on exploring. There's a really good. Um, I was uh, Radio 4 Extra the other day in um, TED Radio. So you get TED Radio uh, downloadable podcast. There's one on play. And it's showing how the role of play in terms of education. And that would be where that would, you know, all this idea of playing in terms of learning IT and stuff. But of course, you know, you never teach them to read because goodness knows what they can read. And you never teach, you know, it's, it's extreme, isn't it? It's what you shouldn't do. I think we're, are we actually yeah. moving towards coffee time? It's coffee, yeah. So that's it. Thank you very much for coming.